Hey there. Hi, welcome to Heliotropes, episode three. My name's Julia. My name is Kojo. And today we're gonna start off by taking you through some uh, some news stories that happened over the past week, and then we're gonna um, dive in to our main topic. So let's start with the news stories. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah, so um, as a continuation of our main story from our last episode about um, Tara Reid's sexual assault allegation against Joe Biden, I just wanted to update you about that. So there is a story in the New York Times. They picked, up, they picked it up. Um, there's not a lot more information, and they said that they did some more digging and found some folks who could corroborate some things and some other folks who say that they don't even remember who Tara Reid is or having a conversation with her. Um, still the same information around Joe Biden, um, his spokesperson or media relations person um, saying that the allegation is untrue. Um, I think it's worthy to note that Tara Reid did file a police report on Thursday. She said that it was mostly... Um, for protection against threats that she was receiving and anticipated receiving. Perfect. And we will put a link to the story so you can read more about it if you'd like to. Um, also in the news, in uh, anyway, the Defense Production Act, I just want to go really quickly over what it is and Really, that's it. I'm not going to really talk about why it's important. But what it is ultimately is an act that dates back to 1950. It was a congressional uh, legislation that allowed the president to... It gave the president of the United States authority over manufacturing processes to make sure at the time that there were enough goods to supply the Korean War effort. Um, since then, it's been invoked pretty regularly. I mean, there's four authorities um, related to it as far as, you know, what is essentially four stipulations. And the first one is invoked pretty regularly uh, by Congress, from what I understand. But, um, yeah, long story short, the president of the United States, Donald Trump, invoked, he signed the act on March 17th. Uh, I believe, and or 18th, March 18th, and then on March 27th, he enacted it for the first time during this crisis to get GM to produce um, ventilators at cost. It is worth noting that the way that story was covered and his incentive for doing so can possibly, probably knowing him, have been racially motivated. Um, the CEO of GM and gender uh, or sex, you know, she's a woman, a uh, Latina woman, this CEO of GM uh, and, you know, they butted heads over pricing. So he invoked the act to take control of that. And then it was invoked again to get, get 3M to produce respirators for the United States and to stop exporting them to Latin America and Canada. Which 3M has stated might eventually have a negative impact on the United States because it may encourage other countries not to send uh, materials, to yeah, to the United States. Right. Um, and so there's a big dispute going on about that. Yeah. I also think it's important to mention that many people believe had the Defense Production Act been enacted much earlier, then we would have been able to. Uh, flatten the curve much sooner and avoid the crises of our healthcare professionals and essential workers um, getting sick really quickly. And I think another piece that ties into this too is that while people thought that that should have been enacted much earlier, the United States, Donald Trump, was actually sending equipment to China to help them um, in the COVID crisis, despite knowing that we would soon be in crisis as well. And while it's nice to help other folks, Right, there's a balancing act that comes into play. Right. And it was probably for money. You know, not altruism. You know, sending them and then the Chinese pay us. At a premium, I would imagine. Um, another update. Unemployment is now at 16.6 million. That is 16.6 .6 million people who have filed for unemployment in the past three weeks. 
um, which means unemployment has gone in a matter of a few weeks from record lows to record highs. Um, for context, that's five, just above 5% of the entire U.S. population, and it is about 10.5% of what the U.S. active labor force was projected to be at the beginning of 2020, which is 1.58 million, or sorry, 158 million people. It's about half of the United States population um, who can work. Now 10% of them are out of work, which, you know, it's going to have huge upstream effects, you know, and that's not even to mention all the people who um, have not filed for unemployment, who have not been able to file for unemployment because of the bottlenecks and people who have not filed for unemployment because they're just above struggling to, you know, giving up. We're still very much at the beginning of this uh, crisis, this economic crisis, this recession impending. Um. Yeah, and I, one of the other like major kind of pieces around that this past week too is that on Wednesday or Thursday, the Dow had the best day it's had right. since I think 1938. Right. And people often refer to the stock market as an indicator of how well the economy is doing. So in the same week, we had record numbers of unemployment and a record number for the Dow which tells you basically all you need to know about where the government's interests are and not just the Republican government either. I think that's important to mention, right? Like where the power and the money and where all those interests are because they're certainly not with the American people. Otherwise, the stimulus package would have been reversed. Right. And that's, that's something we covered a good bit in the first podcast. So if you haven't tuned into that, make sure you check it out. It's only two podcasts back, Heliotropes. Episode one, we talk about the government and the economy and everything. And I do just want to point out really quickly that as far as um, unemployment filing and unemployment checks and receiving your checks, you know, the data does indicate, it does suggest that employers who file unemployment for their employees tend to, those files move faster, right? So if you are an employer or if you're an employee who has a good enough relationship with your employer, try to make that happen. If you file yourself, it'll be a slower process. If your employer files for you, it should be a faster process. All right, so now we're gonna switch into talking a little bit about elections. So on Tuesday, as many of you probably saw um, on the news, Wisconsin held its primary election. Um, and in addition to the presidential, or the Democratic primary, and the presidential primary, there are also a number of really important down ballot races that people were supposed to be voting on as well. Now, you might be asking yourself, a primary election in the middle of COVID when many states have shelter in place orders and the government has told people that they need to maintain social distancing, how could that happen? Well, that's a great question and it's something that a lot of people were concerned about because as you know, often when you go to the polling place, it's difficult to maintain six feet of distance or more, and there's often lines and you're interacting with people and that's part of the entire process. So I wanna point out that one of the most hotly contested races on the ballot and probably one of the most important one, according to many people, is that there was a race for a Wisconsin State Supreme Court seat and the race was between an incumbent conservative uh, judge and a more liberal um, challenger who was running on a social justice platform. Now the Wisconsin State Supreme Court is currently at a 5-2 majority and so this could switch that to a 4-3 majority, so still a conservative majority, but with a little bit more pull um, from a more social justice progressive kind of ideology and mindset. Now the governor of Wisconsin is a Democratic governor and that's important to note because he wanted to um, make the election in June so that people could um, feel free to vote and be safe while they were doing that. However, the Wisconsin State Supreme Court overturned that ruling um, and then decided that they were going to hold the elections on their state election day. Reason that One of the reasons that this race was so important um, for the Supreme Court 
is because there's a redistricting year coming up in Wisconsin. And Wisconsin is one of the most gerrymandered states, which allows a certain group, in this case, a certain conservative Republican group, to hold and maintain power and switch, you know, adjust districting so that can stay true for them. And so that's coming up again. Um, and how they redistrict again will affect voting and voting rights and turnout. And there's another piece too that there are going to be um, some what we call like hot button social issues coming into play as well, such as abortion, which several states have been using this COVID crisis to uh, limit and completely restrict abortion. And um, religious liberty as well will come into play. So, right, it's like what we always hear about in terms of voting for a DA and voting for judges. They have a long lasting impact on um, people's rights. And I think it's worthy to note that not accepting or limiting voting, voter turnout, is a... Uh, long-held practice amongst typically conservative and Republican folks in this country because they believe that the more people who are able to vote, the more progressive and democratic this country will become. And so we just watched it all play out in Wisconsin as we've watched it play out uh, in several places, including in Georgia last year. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, yeah, oh yeah. Ugh been so long which is you know it's also important because we're also seeing coming out of this whole thing um a push for you know mail-in ballots right it's not that uh congregating to vote is the only option there are other options to exercising the right to vote in this country and you know especially given the current circumstances as julia said you know all the dangers of congregating to do so um, we should be exploring other options, right? The point is to vote. The point is not to sit and wait in line and you know increase your risk of disease so you can vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it will have significant implications in the presidential election because there is a belief that we we don't know where we're going to be in November yet in terms of yeah. the health crisis and what does that mean for voting for a president. And then on that topic, see, on that topic, um, as many of you already know, Bernie Sanders dropped out of the race. He suspended his campaign. I know as if 2020 couldn't get any worse, he's, he's out. And I've been getting a lot of questions as far as um, what are you going to do? You know, people ask, what are you going to do now that Bernie Sanders is out of the race? One, it's important to remember that he's still on the ballot for the primary. The Georgia primary has been postponed again to June 9th, um, and he's still on the ballot, so I'm still going to vote for him uh, in the primary. And he's planning to stay on the ballot for, in all of, in the, for the rest of the primaries. There we go. So if you're, um, if you're a Bernie supporter, I mean, I would su continue to support Bernie, right? Because even if he doesn't win the general election... Seeing his name with a bunch of votes next to it will send a message once all the totals come in in November. Um, and also, don't take this opportunity to say, oh, you know, Bernie's out of the race. I'm, I'm not going to vote or, at all because that's a huge mistake, right? We're not voting for that one president. Like uh, Julia mentioned earlier, that progressive – Bernie still being on the ballot would help um, – I don't know if you mentioned this in the video or if you're – I'm remembering this from before we started recording, but you know, Bernie being on the per ballot would have helped down ballot progressive races, uh, progressive candidates. So what that means is, I mean, essentially, even if Bernie's not on the ballot, people who think like Bernie, people who support Bernie's policies and who are running for other positions, senators, representatives, aldermen, judges, sheriffs, you know, like the whole gamut. Commissioners, Miriam Ahmed, Super District 6 in uh, DeKalb County. I endorse her. Um, you know, like people you, you want in charge, they still need your vote. So go show up and vote for them. I mean, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to vote for Joe Biden. As of right now, I have no reason to. 
I'm not going to vote for Donald Trump. And, you know, perhaps in a future show we can dedicate, a, you know, some more time to, to why the idea of vote blue, no matter who, is absolutely absurd, absolutely ridiculous. It's not founded in any sort of, you know, civic or political scientific knowledge or, yeah, knowledge or wisdom. It's, um, it's rhetoric. It's a talking point, And it's a tool that the democratic establishment uses to um, advance the candidate that they want, right? Because as we can see, you know, the democratic establishment, I don't know if you don't know this, then I don't know where you've been, but they were not supporting Bernie Sanders throughout this entire campaign, literally throughout the entire campaign. Um, to this... You know, and that just reinforces this idea that if the Democratic establishment doesn't believe in vote blue no matter who, because they clearly had it out for Bernie Sanders, then why should you, right? And it, it, again, this there's this idea of uh, voting class or working class antipathy that uh, the political establishment tends to have. And this is one of those, you know. This is one of those things where now that they've ousted, successfully ousted their candidate of choice, if he doesn't win, what they're gonna, what's gonna happen is they're not gonna be like, uh, you know, just like in two thousand sixteen, we played the head, played our hand wrong and supported the wrong candidate. We didn't support the candidate that the people wanted. What they're gonna say is, oh, you know, like this isn't our fault. This is your fault. You didn't vote for Bernie Sanders. You made this happen. You are responsible for Trump being in office, and that's just not the case. I was gonna say, I think you got into the future podcast you talked about us having. Well, no, I'm still, I have so much more to say. Like, literally, I'm sure I've got mad notes. All right. Well, that's some of the news that we thought was important to share with you this week. Obviously, there is, you know, lots of other things. So we hope that you're um, reading from different outlets. And now we're going to switch into our main topic for today's pod. Right. As we talked about last week, um, briefly, we touched on this briefly, the intersection between race and class is starting to come harder into focus as the COVID-19 epidemic takes its toll on the more vulnerable populations um, here in the United States and abroad. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about two of those uh, vulnerable populations. I specifically am going to address the idea of Afrocentricity, Pan-Africanism abroad and the respect, uh, the impact on the COVID-19 of the COVID-19 virus on African peoples and domestically in America's most high profile minority population, African-American population. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to share some information about the chronically ignored and violated indigenous folks, specifically in the United States for this pod. Um, but that information can also typically be generalized to indigenous folks of other countries. And today we're going to talk about the Navajo or the Diné um, nation in the United States. Um, so to you know, kick things off, as far as this is concerned, take notes if you want. Took plenty of notes. I'm going to be referencing them pretty thoroughly throughout this uh, whole thing. The issue of, um, or the idea rather, of a Pan-African response, of an Afrocentric, specifically an Afrocentric response to the coronavirus, first came to my attention about two weeks ago when Seyun Kuti, who if you don't know him, he's a Nigerian entertainer, musician, performer, and son of Fela Kuti, you know. So, um, and he's, he, he's on it, you know, a lot of the times the children of these figures, historical figures don't really live up to, uh, the expectations that you would, you might have set for them, for the children, but like Sam Kuti is, he's all about it. Um, so he brought this to my attention, seeing his video on IGTV brought it to my attention. And his thesis, for the most part, was that due to institutional differences in the infrastructure, social welfare, quality of life, etc., of um, between European and African and like Chinese um, society, it is stupid um, for Africa to approach COVID nineteen response in the same way that the Western countries are doing. And specifically as far as socially isolating and social quarantine, uh, social distancing. Mm 
those things are unreasonable given the circumstances that are present in Nigeria as far as where he was coming from. And a lot of these things, um, they scale. They scale much larger, obviously, than Nigeria. They scale to Africa and in a really significant sense, they scale to the diaspora, the African diaspora. One of the things he mentioned that I thought was really interesting was that he called out the relationship um, specifically of class because, you know, Nigeria is, for the most part, racially homogenous. It's not ethnically homogenous. It's not uh, really religiously homogenous, but it is uh, racially uh, homogenous as far as the construct of race is concerned. Um, so the main differences there that we would, you know, c consider as far as intersectionality or as far as... Uh, is class. And one of the things he mentioned, this is a quote from him, quote, COVID is going to be relegated to something that is decimating our poor, end quote. And what he means by that is um, obviously social distancing measures, social isolation measures, and he goes over all this in the video. They benefit the, or rather, yeah, they benefit those with the resources in society. Very similar to here, right? Because the people with the resources they can, they can social isolate in leisure, they have the space, they have the food, they have the water to, to be able to do something like that. But everyone else doesn't have that luxury. The main thing, the main difference that he's describing is this um, intersection between race and class. And when you extrapolate, when you scale that up, that intersection between race and class becomes fundamentally a pan-African issue. Uh, so real quick, you know, what is Pan-Africanism? And Pan-Africanism, this is another quote from a Thomas Wakiaga who delivered a really, it was a really nice, he's a student, um, African student from Kenya. I wasn't really clear where, but he gave a really nice TED talk, TEDx talk on uh, Pan-Africanism and what it is and what it means to him. Link below in the description. He says, quote, Oh, sorry. He says that Pan-Africanism is, quote, an ideology that asserts and supports the solidarity of Africans worldwide. And, you know, obviously the passion that he gave in the speech kind of like helped to drive that home. He really believes in it. Just to be clear, as far as um, the terminology that I will be using in this, you know, breakdown, Pan-Africanism, when I refer to that, will be referring to this ideology of concurrent struggle and parallel uplift across the diaspora that unites people of African uh, descent. And Afrocentric or Afrocentricity refers to a specific mode of action which focuses on how to address an issue that African people are facing for African people, all right? COVID is a situation that everyone is facing, right? Europe is handling that situation that is also you know, affecting African people, but they're handling that situation for Europe. That's, they're using a Eurocentric model. In order to um, impact African people, when, if we, we're focusing our attention for the purposes of this talk on African people. So it's an Afrocentric. How do we best take the situations that apply to African people for African people? So it's an Afrocentric model of uh, action. So you talked about um, the importance of a Pan-African response for African people and people in the African diaspora. What and how you know Europe is um, using a Eurocentric response? What is important about um, the an Afrocentric or Pan-African response to the COVID nineteen pandemic? Right. Um... That's a good question. Thanks for that question. Um, I think the biggest thing, the biggest thing about a Pan-African response, the reason it applies, right, from Nigeria to here to Chicago, obviously, um, and elsewhere, is essentially because the common histories of racism and colonial oppression across the di African diaspora mm -hmm have produced commonalities in the present condition of African people across the diaspora. And I'll just go over real quick a few of what those commonalities are 
Um, disproportionate exposure and vulnerability to poverty, low wage work, economic dependence, health risk, quality, low quality neo-colonial educations, imprisonment, etc. All manifest largely regardless of where in the diaspora you go. Um, and they manifest specifically in African communities. For example, um, in the US, in Brazil, in France, in majority white mm, Brazil, look out. In majority white um, countries with large African Afro diasporic populations, that's where these things come in. And that's again where you can more clearly, most clearly see this uh, link between race and class or ethnicity and class. Um, so specifically, you know, as far as some specific instances of things that, uh, that are different in, okay, so, okay. For the most part, again, all of those things you can see in um, anywhere you go in the diaspora. As far as specific manifestations in those majority white uh, countries with large Afro-diasporic populations, Thanks for that terminology, uh, that phraseology. There are, we run into things like reliance on public transportation, right? In large metropolitan areas, lack of public resources like clean or even running water, right? Think Flint, right? This isn't just a, a thing that you find in remote areas in Africa. It's, they're very much present here. Um, Af people of African descent are less likely to be able to work from home, right? And this translates to either working essential jobs, which put them at higher risk for infection because they're out interacting with people, or working non-essential jobs from which the number suggests they've already been laid off, right? Um, again, because they have, um, we have an higher rates of economic dependence, um, in general, right? Lower rates of self-employment, lower rates of entrepreneurship, things like that. Healthcare access and risk is uh, different. Lifestyles and, you know, uh, the general nature of, you know, being a victimized, oppressed minority in a country increases your really risk for like everything across the board. Um, all cause mortality, a lot of comorbidities associated with any given thing, including coronavirus, which is super crucial, right? Because, I mean, just like with the flu, with most infectious diseases, I suppose, if you already have an underlying condition, then um, if you catch this thing, it's going to be that much more difficult mm -hmm. for you to recover. Um, the prison system, I have written here that the prison system is already fucked up. I mean, it doesn't really need any uh, explanation. Although I will say that the U.S. has the highest, you know, civilian prison population of any civilized country. Civilized country. I'm not even going to say civilized. Doesn't even deserve that. Westernized country, industrialized country. There we go. In the world, um, people of African descent, African Americans in particular, higher risk of jeopardy for losing their housing, defaulting on payments, and in general just falling even deeper into already massive levels of debt mm -hmm. you know we have lower um family values wealth values um in general things like that prison abolit oh sorry prison mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then you know this is just a side note going into things that the idea of prison abolition i mean 100 percent take that home um but Right now, one of the things, the big things is that we're calling for the release of prisoners, nonviolent offenders, you know, other qualifications to, mm -hmm. from prisons where coronavirus or and detention centers where coronavirus infections pose a super high risk because it's um, close, quarters. close quarters, which also parallels to the idea that a lot of uh, <clears throat> people of African descent across the diaspora, given all the conditions mentioned before, are forced to live, especially in urban areas, in close quarters, right? Like fish. What's the tuna fish in a can metaphor? Which also increase their risk, right? It's not like uh, suburban America where everyone's spread out, living in the houses and stuff. Um, but as far as prisons are concerned, you know, all of these people are packed into these prisons and now they're being sent home, sent back to their communities, which 
to the extent that they've been exposed to the virus poses an additional risk, right? If your community is on some sort of lockdown and you're receiving people from these places that are supposed to be uh, dangerous concentra- harbor dangerous concentrations of uh, coronavirus holding people, then um, that poses, you know, it's just, it's a risk that, um, I mean, I think it's worth it to get these people out of prison but it's also you need to think about it in order to be able to prepare that much better for it. Yeah, so I mean it sounds like what you're saying in terms of an afrocentric or pan-african response to COVID-19 is a consideration of the unique life experiences that in this case african or people in the african diaspora are encountering, right? right? Like day to day like unique aspects of their lives that would require different kinds of response and support Mm -hmm. and I think the same could be said too for indigenous populations Um, and many of the things that you mentioned in terms of what are often referred to in this country as underlying conditions um, also affect indigenous populations in this country and so I appreciate how one you didn't use the phrase underlying conditions because I think as many of us know that is a very heavily coded way of talking about racism and colonialism and oppression and violence um, and the effects that those things have had on specific communities who are now um, vulnerable. Um, And so... Who've been made vulnerable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so when I think about... um, the Navajo Nation or the Diné Nation. Um, For those of you who don't know, it is, um, in terms of land mass, a nation made up of 27,000 acres that covers part of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. And on the reservation, there are more than 150,000 folks living on the reservation. Um, In total, there's about 330,000 Uh, tribal members of the Diné Nation. And many of the same things come up that you're talking about in terms of um, health care, health conditions, um, running water, clean water. There's a huge limitation of running water on the reservation. Um, Health conditions such as diabetes because of I mean, I think a lot of people blame it on alcohol, and I think it's important to remember that the people who introduced alcohol were the white settlers, um, often in exchange for land or goods or other things. Um, And so diabetes is a huge factor in that, which we know um, can increase the mortality rate um, for COVID-19. And then similar to what you mentioned, Kojo, about... um, kind of like overcrowding in urban areas, that exists on reservations as well, except for they're in rural areas where you often have many generations in a family living together. And that can happen for various reasons. One, I mean, like culturally, um, you know, like community is just viewed differently and family is viewed differently. And then there's also similar things that you were mentioning in terms of um, unemployment rates, job loss, debt, um, like difficulty accessing housing and affordable housing, um, and the way that it's come about for different populations, at least in this country, and really I think probably in many countries, um, is different because of the role that the government has had. Um, But many of the same, uh, I guess many parts of the relationship feel quite similar. I mean, I would definitely imagine so. Um, If I can, I'm going to go over a couple of other things, and I want to know, you know, what you think as far as the overlap there as well. Um, Another issue, another thing that makes Pan-Africanism important in considering what uh, our Afrocentric response to certain communities should be is that the uh, neo-colonial and neoliberal state apparatuses that exist in Africa, that exist in the West, have um, historically been geared toward resource extraction versus social uplift. 
All right, and, and that's to say that instead of trying to help the people out and um, you know help uplift the country and help uplift the people, it's all about consumerism and putting goods and markets into their communities so that the people who live there spend the money, the little money that they do have. And it ultimately has this trickle-up effect, right, that we've seen that's a hallmark of neoliberalism, one of the few in which, right, you put the money in, you put the goods in, sorry, and then the money flows up and then it really doesn't come back down. And then there's this idea of, and this is the one that I'm really curious about as far as what the, where the overlap is, um, because it's pervasive throughout the diaspora mistrust of healthcare providers, right, across the diaspora. And real quick, if you're not familiar with that, if you're like, oh, why, right? And this is particularly important for, like, conversations around vaccines, you know, because I know that's a really strong one. And people are like, oh, you feel really strongly on both sides. And people who are um, pro-vaccines just really don't get it at all why anyone would be anti-vax. But there's this concept of medical apartheid, which essentially refers to the disproportionate use of or misuse of medical experimentation on, in this case, African peoples, uh, both here in the United States and in Africa, especially. Um, and I can only assume across the diaspora in countries like Brazil, uh, and so on and so forth. And, you know, just real quick, some a few examples, the Tuskegee experiments, if you're familiar with that. If you're not, look it up. Um, botched vaccine testing in sub-Saharan Africa. All right, that's a thing. Also look that up. He's famous here, infamous, the father of modern gynecology. His name was James Marion Sims. And if you're not familiar with him, you should also look it up. Disgusting stuff, uh, like absolutely absurd. And one of the things I do want to point out here is that the, um, right, you know, everyone knows that Nazis were terrible. Right, they were absolutely awful people who did awful things to people who definitely didn't deserve any of it. And one of the things that Nazi doctors are infamous for, especially, is for experimenting on people, doing heinous experiments that um, a lot of which were frivolous and torturous. And the ones that weren't completely fl flivorous, the ones that did contribute in some way or from which we were able to extract as a society in some way some significant medical achievements. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say there. But the point is they did – they were awful, right? And people know that. But when um, – right, this Marion Sims character, the idea of medical apartheid – and the impact that that has, the devastating impact that that has had on both the patients and you know the culture in general, that instilling that deep sense of mistrust into you know the healthcare and medical institutions, it's unsung. It's hugely underrated, and um, I, I will get to that later as far as the responsibility of those institutions to rebuild that trust versus just expecting people to suddenly trust them again. Um, to, but just to say, you know, the history and um, Harriet Washington wrote this book. It's called Medical Apartheid, published in 2007. I'm going to put a link to that book below again or also. Um, it's worth checking out. The book is huge. That's just a testament to like the amount of material there is to go off of as far as how long and consistent this history is. You know, I saw an article that said something about... It was about the book. It said something about, uh, you know, the Tuskegee experiments. A lot of people are familiar with that one. It wasn't an anomaly. It was just, you know, a publicized instance of something that's been going on for too long. Um, but the residual, right, this, uh, I guess part of that is that in this sense that it wasn't an anomaly, that it was commonplace, like people were making doctors, medical professionals, scientists, were making, um, like this was codified in books. You know, you go to med school and you learn that, ah, oh, you know, like black people don't experience pain. Uh, so you don't need to use anesthesia for that operation. Heinous, you know, it's really insane. You know, it, it mm -hmm. takes a lot to keep it in, you know, not, you know, go off on the idea of it. But just to finish that up, the residue of that history still applies today, right? It's still, it can be measured in surveys. It can be measured in, uh, 
I mean modern texts. You know, you can be you can go and talk to med students. Um, it still exists today. It still applies today in medical education and implicit biases of African Americans' intelligence, pain tolerance, fertility, and more. Um, so those are things that you can go and look up. And like I said, you know, those are two things that I'm curious as to how they apply mm -hmm. specifically how those things manifest in the Navajo, in the Denai community. Yeah, and I was just thinking too, you know, the amount of people who are often turned away, right? right? And we know about um, black women giving birth and the high death rates and not being believed that something was going on or being turned away or not being kept in the hospital and wondering how that's manifesting too during this time of COVID about um, folks showing up to emergency rooms with symptoms or calling the hotlines and talking about symptoms and um, being given different medical advice um, than white folks. So I think similar, similarly, um, so I can't speak from personal experience. I do not identify as an indigenous individual. Um, and so I want to be careful in terms of how I share this information and what I know in terms of like what I've read and heard from folks um, while working on a reservation. And I've heard from um, some other folks that I've talked with about the mistrust. I mean, I there is an inherent mistrust in the federal government of this country for indigenous folks, which impacts um, the mistrust um, for medical professionals as well, especially because of how um, healthcare is provided on reservations and the different rules in terms of what is funded by the federal government um, versus what is funded by the reservations themselves. Um, so yes, there's an inherent mistrust there. I mean, beginning from when the very first white settlers came and smallpox and other diseases that, um, you know, white people murdered just an incredible amount of indigenous folks in this country. And I think, you know, you mentioned, um, sterilization and, that's affected the indigenous community. And then I think about, um, you know, other ways that the indigenous community has been affected in terms of like boarding schools and trying to make indigenous folks be white. Right. And so like trying to extract that culture and community and identity out of them um, in various ways, which I also imagine happened in the healthcare industry as well. Um, I mean, there's a serious underfunding for the Indian Health Service. And oftentimes, uh, tribal nations depend on funding from the U.S. government, which was promised in past treaties, which the U.S. government, uh, you know, continuously breaks. And so they're often underfunded, so they don't have the resources that they need to treat. And this is things outside of a health pandemic, right? Like, so there's just not enough money. Um, and so it would be difficult to trust that when you're going in to see somebody that you're going to get exactly what it is that you need or to even, you know, have access to get there. Um, as there are, they're in rural areas and, um, you know, can often be like pretty far away to get to a medical facility. Do you have anything else to share before we get to solutions? Yeah, so I do want to share just a little bit more factual information um, in terms of like why understanding the impact that COVID has on indigenous peoples is important and worth spending time on, <laughs> excuse me, other than the fact that, you know, they're also people. Um, for uh, the Diné people, so I mentioned before um, what their population is, and as of the 10th, so that's two days ago now, there were 597 positive cases of COVID on the reservation, 
and 22 confirmed deaths from COVID on the reservation. And that can be compared to 13 deaths in the entire state of New Mexico, which is a state that has 13 times the population of the Diné reservation. And so, I mean, like thinking about the numbers, that just feels really important to kind of hold on to and grapple with. Um, and I also wanted to bring up the point as well that tribal nations must apply for grants from the federal government to get money from the stimulus package. And that is not something that cities and counties in the United States outside of tribal nations have to do. So that's adding additional bureaucracy and additional time to get appropriate funding to set up things like field hospitals, which would be like, and I know this is like kind of getting into the solution part, but that's something that would be a unique need to folks on a reservation. So a field hospital would be set up so that people who have COVID could isolate so that they wouldn't um, infect other folks who they're staying with because we know, right, that there, there's some indoor crowding happening, um, which is different from, you know, other parts of the country. And I also think it's really worth mentioning, too, um, that there is, I think, one of the impacts that COVID could have would be, could be incredibly devastating, which is that because of the relationship that colonialism and neocolonialism has had and continues to have with indigenous populations in this country, the indigenous population has been decimated and the culture has been, right, the, um, they've tried to just completely remove the culture and through like various means. And if COVID like rips through these indigenous populations, we could see you know, just like potentially extinction of languages and cultures and traditions. And that's on top of decades and decades and decades of traditions being outlawed and languages not being allowed to be spoken in public so that kids wouldn't learn them. So that, right, like all these different things that we know that make up cultures um, would disappear. That's genocide. Yes. Like according to international law, all of those policies that have been legally codified on top of, you know, this situation and, you know, the previous viral the relationship that, you know, indigenous populations have with uh, Western white people bringing disease that wiped them out, that's all, it's genocide. Yes. It is genocide. And the part about um the underfunding from the government and the stimulus package not including direct money and direct funding while knowing the right like while placing individuals in these vulnerable positions knowingly and being aware of these circumstances and a continued underfunding and a continued delay in resources i mean could be absolutely devastating and it's heartbreaking and it's something that hopefully um, we can find some solutions to, um, at least in the meantime and on a personal level. So the overlap of um, relevance between the African solution, Afrocentric and Pan-African ideas that you have expressed as far as they relate to COVID-19 and everything that you expressed as far as how the Dene people are impacted by this, that, I mean, brings me to a, a really important point that I want to address real quick about Pan-Africanism and how it's ultimately essentially aligned with a certain dignity of the human condition. Uh, Pan-Africanism is about solidarity amongst African people and, you know, collective uplift. But 
it's not exclusive, right? The principles of Pan-Africanism are not exclusive to African people. And I think that's a really important thing, you know, especially in this day and age when solidarity struggles or like cooperation and cohesion between and amongst solidarity struggles are really important. If you're out there and, you know, Pan-Africanism relates to you, um, but you haven't really thought about connecting the Africanism in Pan-Africanism with you know, like the indigenous struggles of people, right? Because Africans on the continent are the indigenous people of that continent, right? So at the core of Pan-Africanism is both, right, immigrant rights, indigenous people's rights, and, I mean, any host of other things. Um, and I guess we'll get to those things. I just wanted to share that real quick. Yeah, and I appreciate your use of the word dignity and dignity of the human condition um, for a lot of reasons, but it feels like a it feels like something that we're missing right now and have been missing for a long time, at least in this country, in terms of like a national perspective. Yeah. I also think you bring up um, an interesting question about who can identify as Pan-African um, yeah. that we could explore in the future yeah. based on like how you just defined it and how you talked about it. Um, but I'm sure there will be varying opinions about it. <laughs> there will be. And if you have any, if you have any opinions ex specifically right now about like who can identify, who counts as Pan-Africanism, <laughs> go ahead and you know, mention it in the comments. Have a little Not thing. Yeah, we didn't get there yet. What do you mean? I don't want them to talk about it yet. We don't know when we're going to get to the pod. No, nah, go ahead and do it. <laughs> we want you to comment in the comments. If you have anything to put in the comments, go ahead and put them in there. Um, and, you know, maybe if you decide to comment on that, it'll give us some, uh... <laughs> you know, uh... <laughs> moving on. <laughs> Hair everywhere. What should our response be? And as far as, you know, my own calculus, Just <laughs> the, w there are two main sectors to take into account, to keep in mind. Um, the two-pronged response to the COVID-19 should be directed, one, at the state, at government uh, apparatuses that we've mentioned, and two, at the people, right? Like, what can the people do? without the government or with the government's aid, but like what can we be responsible for and you know, what can we enact? And to start, I do want to say that before we get to specific solutions or you know, more specific solutions, government demands should feature longstanding structural changes to the institutions of the state and society rather than band-aid solutions. And what I mean by that is, you know, in part, socialism, the principles of uh, democratic socialism have been a long part, long standing part of Pan-African political and uh, economic platforms for a long time. Um, and, you know, in the U.S. specifically, we're seeing, right, like socialism it had its t it had its day, the Great uh, Depression, I mean, early 19th century. Uh, and then a resurgence in the 1960s, 1970s, when the African independence movements uh, spurred our own civil rights movements. Socialism domestically saw another resurgence here in popularity. Socialism, communism, they both did. And then they died back down. And then here in 2016, following, you know, in the wake of what was essentially the uh, Black Lives Matter movement, we saw another rise of, you know, populism and socialism. So those are really important parallels to keep in mind. And <clears throat> even with that rise in socialism, there was a lot of political opposition to it, right? And political opposition that was bolstered by the average person being like, I don't know about that socialism. Look at Venezuela, look at Cuba, look at China, look at, you know, as if, you know, there aren't other examples of uh, people who've been doing it right. But I just want to point out really quickly that here in the U.S., it is, you know, a socialist policy, the socialist policy of um, handing out checks, direct payments to, you know, the people has manifested thus far as a one-time policy of 
to the people. That's a perfect example of taking an otherwise great idea and watering it down so much that it's a band-aid. All right. Um, that's a perfect example of what we should not settle for as far as developing Pan-African solutions. And not even the good kind of band-aid. Right. Like the paint on band-aid that doesn't stick or do anything. Boom. Or a used band-aid that also doesn't <laughs> stick or do anything. That's really gross. Mm. And it really just makes things worse. I guess it is, it's the paint on Because it, you know, like, again, you know, $1,200 is better than nothing, right? The government is literally doing the bare minimum that they could be doing. Mm -hmm. And I guess technically they are doing more than they did the last, during the last economic crisis, as far as the working class is concerned. But still, so as far as more specific, um, detailed demands from the state, from a Pan-African perspective, some of the things that we can do include demanding massive universal and welfare, sorry, universal welfare and healthcare assistance. Um, this would prevent the need for non-essential workers to work in the face mm -hmm. of unnecessary risk. It would reduce the volume of public transport or on pu public transport and further mitigate risk. Universal health care is something that we need to call for, uh, it, and that really doesn't need any explanation. It's a medical pandemic, so people should be able to... Um, Get health care without going into debt. Right, right. And as far as food deserts and under-resourced um, areas are concerned... There should be food and water delivery, right? Those are things that I would call for from the state. Food and water delivery, virtual education programs. Um, Richard Wolf, uh, in, he brought up this really interesting idea of um, mobilizing the community, right? And he didn't put it this way. I'm putting it this way. But mobilizing the community and the many talents that lie within the community to kind of do, uh, this was his idea, tutorial type education program so to switch from like a the standard education model to a tutorial education model in which instead of having this curriculum that's defined by the state and defined by the city and local officials you switch to learning skills or trades or tasks that other people who live around you or other people who you can connect with virtually are good at right you know the thing they say if you're in this situation you don't come out having learned a new skill you know what have you done in a sense, that's kind of, um, you know, I mean, that's elitist, right? But there is some uh, value in it, right? The idea that you shouldn't take this time if you can afford not to, to like, you know, just sit down and do stuff, right? You should, um, especially if you're a student, especially if you would be using this time otherwise to like, you know, further acquire knowledge. We're going to agree to disagree on this. So, But I do think one of the important things that if you're going to do like, virtual learning is that everyone needs access to the internet too which like it's 2020 and that's pretty common in a lot of other countries right so people need access to internet and need equipment and that is one of the things that um i feel like it's reasonable to demand from the government just because there's plenty of cities plenty of metropolitan areas that already offer free wi-fi uh free public wi-fi and depending again on where you are like you said it is not, I mean, I don't see it being much, right? It's already part of, included in many aid uh, programs, not nearly enough, is the distribution of laptops. You know, that's something that many states can subsidize. Um, so free educational programs, in that sense, modified educational programs. Um virtual education, the absolute suspension of criminal police activity or right, you know, punitive police activity is something else that I would call from from the state. And I do think that's super important. Um, in the event that the state does not feel comfortable doing that, I mean, we should continue to demand it since, you know, the comfort of the state is not really the priority in the case of an epidemic, in the case of a crisis. Um, but an alternative, something I would suggest is that the either right there's a couple of things that a couple of directions that this can go one the police can be trained to you know protect and serve and they could be remolded to 
distribute those resources, right? Because people are going to need, if the state is distributing fresh water, if the state is distributing food, um, if the state is distributing laptops and installing Wi-Fi connections, police can be involved to make some of that stuff happen. I think they can just be trained to serve because service is protection. Right. Good point. Um, and then on the other side of that is, you know, as far as calling for the abolition of police in general, because it is important to note that the institution of the police as uh, corrupt and, you know, fundamentally Western and capitalist and abusive as it is, um, hasn't always existed. It's a pretty modern formation, especially here, you know, in the United States, you can tie the uh, genesis of police forces to, you know, uh, Southern whites trying to mobilize to make sure that enslaved uh, Africans remained property, which is, you know, it's own crazy thing. But as far as alternatives to the police, you know, if it's institutional and ideological that they are maligned against the interests of the people, you can also begin to train, you know, a like-minded group of people who have the interest, the best interest of the pe people in mind, the best interest of the community, the intention to serve, you know, and the, um, the will to serve. And you can train them to be a civic uh, force of enforcement. Um, and this is very idealist, but it is the goal is to take whatever good that the police does and have that exist in a space where none of the bad does. The idea is that the police needs mm -hmm. fundamental reformation and this is an opportunity to experiment with ways to make that happen. An additional piece as well, which is um, for indigenous folks, I'm thinking specifically land redistribution um, and in Massachusetts right now, the Department of the Interior is trying to remove the land of the Wampanoag tribe. Um, and just in general, I think like if we're going to be talking about idealistic long-term solutions, you talked about resource extraction um, a while ago. Um, white folks extracted resource in terms of land from indigenous peoples in this country. And so land redistribution um, would be on that list. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just to throw that in, the Wampanoag tribe is the, um, it's the tribe that people celebrate during Thanksgiving, right? So if you feel like you're not invested, um, you should feel like you're invested. If at the very least, because it's very likely that every year you sit down at a table and honor that tribe in the most colonial way possible. So this is one of those times to make right. Um, the other side of the state coin, right? So the whole thing about the state is whatever our Pan-African solutions are to addressing these issues, we should keep in mind that insofar as they can directly impact and improve the conditions on the ground for um, coronavirus treatment and handling the epidemic, in the long run, they should also be things that will serve to improve, improve uh, quality of life, standard of living for the people living in wherever, and um, things that will bolster the population to withstand, better withstand future crises. Um, the other side of the coin is grassroots organizing, you know, and this is something specifically that, you know, I realized, uh, in conversation with Julia a few days ago uh, around this subject is that like, uh, we went over earlier, a hallmark of the Pan-African condition is the failure of the state to uphold its end of the deal as far as, um, the social contract, right? Uphold its end of the deal as far as looking out for the people because as Julia just mentioned, right? It's that resource extracting. Extracting not only the hard physical resources but setting things up in such a way that the state ex extracts what few human resources or what few resources humans have to the top. Um, so rather than coming up with a platform position that solely relies on making concessions from the state, demanding concessions from the state, we're also trying to figure out what the people on the ground can do to organize. 
and how to best organize. <laughs> and a few ideas there include um, mobilizing organizers, volunteers, good people doing uh, the work that the government allegedly for the people by the people should be doing and cannot bring itself to do because it's been historically too busy misappropriating funds and resources for racist, sexist reasons to prepare for a crisis. Um, first and foremost, grassroots organizers should look to those um, institutional authorities to make sure that they have the most up-to-date and accurate information uh, possible about the crisis, right? That's key. If we're going to do something about it, we need to know what we need to do about it. Two, we need to be able to disseminate that information quickly and accurately and in just as you know, up-to-date a manner. All right, so um, the first two things that you know, would be in this platform position are there around information. What information are we getting and how can we give out that information as uh, efficiently as possible? Um, it is important to note, you know, as far as grassroots organizing, that it is significantly more difficult, um, you know, on a very fundamental than working with institutional backing and institutional support. You know, on the one hand, it's often either volunteers who are working for free or organizers who are working for way less than they deserve to be working for, who make up the body of this, uh, this effort. And what, how that usually translates, uh, manifests, is um, a lot of people don't want to do it. They don't feel invested in it. They don't feel like it's their job because it's not a job that people get paid for or, like we just said, get well paid well for. So the numbers often aren't there. You know, Organizations need volunteers, and they're not having those volunteers present. And <laughs> what this um, ultimately does means is that uh, one, at any given moment, uh, the organizers and volunteers on the ground don't have the sufficient cover to cover 100% of the population, right? Mm -hmm. So if they're distributing food, they don't have enough food, they don't have enough people to give out all of that food um, to everyone in a given community, mm -hmm. for example. <clears throat> And then two, they don't have the uh, support to indefinitely sustain certain efforts at scale. Mm -hmm. And what that means is if you don't, um, I mean, it just means it's, you can't keep this operation going for long enough. If people need a month of food, if people need a month of delivery services in order to sustain themselves, but we don't have enough volunteers or enough organizers to be able to feed people for a month, then the people in that community are gonna suffer. It's important to note that there are, as we speak already, and there have been massive organizing efforts that are underway, and they're tackling any number of things. Um, anything that we addressed in the issues that you know plague the Pan-African community in general, those things are all things that are being addressed in some way. Uh, as we mentioned before, they're not being uh, targeted necessarily at scale due to you know a lack of volunteers or a lack of enthusiasm from the community in general as far as uh, you know altruism and you know other things but you know those things do include food delivery programs they do include um, the creation of medical supplies, right? Some people are at home, they're making masks, they're mm -hmm. selling masks at, you know, low costs um, to, you know, help recoup those losses because, again, it's volunteer stuff. And they are, there are food, I already said that, calling for, people calling for prisoner release. There are programs, you know, offering to, like, El Refugio, uh, transport, or, you know, be the liaison between prisoner de or immigrant detention centers and the airports that are going to get them to wherever they're going from the center, whether it's in the States or abroad. Um, there are organizations that are mobilizing to cover people's healthcare costs, things like that. So those are all really good examples of um, general um, things that we can do here and things that are already being done here in the United States. 
to uh, cover people's costs. And as far as you know, the Afrocentric and Pan African response, as far as the response that response is concerned for African people, I do think it's important to keep in mind that as far as those resources like computers, uh, like the internet, um, are concerned from people who don't necessarily have access to those things. If you are here in this country and you're in a relatively privileged position um, with money, with you know peace of mind or whatever, then it is very much, um, I would call it an obligation to mobilize and to uh, mobilize your resources specifically, collectively, to help provide these things, right? You could start, you know, in the long term, start uh, investment funds or trusts for African mm -hmm. businesses, African business owners to like keep their businesses going while they can't work at them. Or, I mean, any number of things. Uh, my point being, if it's a problem that we've already mentioned, that is the guidepost for, right? Because ultimately the grassroots effort is about imagining. Or I guess really the whole platform is about imagining. Since the current system as it exists is not sufficient to address the needs of Pan-African, uh, of the diaspora, of Pan-African people, then how can we reimagine solutions to the problems that we know already exist. Um, and then as part of that reimagining, how can we <clears throat> visualize ourselves not just coming up with solutions for that problem, but being a part of the solution to that problem? If I know that people don't have clean water, what can I see myself doing to be able to get people clean water? Right. And not just what can you see yourself doing, but what do people need you to do? who are in those communities that lack clean water. And like I appreciate before how you brought it back around to it's important to focus on our local community and also the global community, right? Like, especially when you're talking about a Pan-African response because before we talked about like the dignity of humanity and community and that the roots and community and caring for each other are so strong that it does feel um, really important to be thinking about I can do this for my local community and how's that going to impact like the wider community and is there something else that I can be doing for the global community as well and if you find yourself in a place where you can't donate money or you can't donate time you could share information to get the word out um, you can talk about these things so that other people who may have time or money um, can help in some capacity um and you can also kind of you know ask yourself do a little bit of reflecting on what it is that feels like you don't have time or money to contribute to something if you feel like it's important right. there's always something you can do there's always something you can do and if you don't feel like there is then that's a problem of imagination more so than a reflection of reality. Yeah, I think, you know, like that's, those are important things to keep in mind about grassroots organizing. And if you want to be involved um, in grassroots organizing and kind of like some of the things to think about in terms of either volunteering or taking on a uh, like, you know, higher profile role in an organization. Mm -hmm. And I also think right like things that we can do on personal level include right like we all have different strengths and I think it's also important to think about the strengths that those communities need in the moment and that's oftentimes funding right like there are usually organizations that are doing wonderful things and people tend to think like oh well I could like do x y and z with that organization even if they're not trained to do those things and that comes from a really great place. And also sometimes the best thing that you can do is to give money so that those efforts can be sustained or that they can be wider reaching. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to get involved in some of those things. And similarly, right, to like how you described uh, Afrocentric response as understanding the needs of the community, those unique needs, and not what we think those needs are 
taking into account what those organizations need from us, not what we want to give. So that's our podcast, you know, episode three. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're going to put some more links in the description below. Don't forget to comment, like, subscribe. That's something we should start saying. Yeah. And subscribe. Yeah. Comment, like. Subscribe. <laughs> more cats in the future. Shout out well, to Merz. Just more of the same cat. No more cats. Oh, oh, it's more of the same cat in the future. Shout out to Moran. Your boy Moran holding it down in New York. And catch y'all next week. Um, we've got plenty of great stuff to talk about. And we hope to see you there. Yeah, thanks for joining us. See ya.